Indie Beacon Radio with hostess Charlotte Canyon. Welcome to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. You can send questions for each show on Twitter using the hashtag Indie Beacon. Now sit back and enjoy learning about our guest for this show. Nice to meet you, Ms. Canyon. <laughs> Hi, I'm your host, Charlotte Canyon, and I'm the 2018 Best Self-Help Book author of you have to laugh to keep from crying how to parent your parents. And on today's show, we are interviewing Charles Norman. Now, Charles is the author of many, many books, but his most recent book is The Fire in the Rock. Charles, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Charles, a lot of times on our, sh our listeners like to know a little of your background. So can you tell us a little bit about your family? Well, where to begin, golly. Um, I'll be 70 this fall, right before the election. And I was uh, born into a United Methodist family. My religion always meant a lot to me. And I, in fact, became a minister early in life. And I was a Methodist preacher for three or four years. And then I left that for reasons that were obscure to me at the time. And uh, remained a committed Christian. This is all relevant to the book, as, as you might remember. And um, I um, began to study Judaism in my late 40s. And the more I read, the more I thought, this is my home. These are the, the things I've always thought, my priorities I've always had, and this is where I need to be. And it was not an easy decision. But I, I converted to the Jewish faith. I like to tell that my Methodist preacher at the time, my minister, was very supportive. My choir director was not. I was the only bass she had who could read music. <laughs> but uh, that's the way it goes. And um, uh, anyway, I, a lot of people convert for reasons of marriage. I didn't meet my wife till 10 years later, and I've never been happier. She's wonderful. Her name is Linnell. But, um, uh, anyway, uh, along about the time I met her, a little before, I began to think about this book. <laughs> and, uh, oh, incidentally, after leaving the ministry, I went through several different jobs, and I eventually fetched up as a middle school teacher, which I did for many, many years. And what and, did you uh, teach? Uh, mostly math. I taught everything at one point or another, including even science, art, and reading. Uh, golly, what and else? what part of the... Yeah, what part of the country were you in? Uh, I was in my hometown of Killeen, Texas, near Fort Hood. Okay. Uh, military base. And, um, and then uh, I moved to the Dallas area, and I taught in Lancaster School District for about a year. And then I taught at a private Jewish school, just pure coincidence. I happened to be teaching there just shortly after I decided to convert. And uh, I always say I learned how to be Jewish there. That was at... Uh, the Solomon Schechter Academy, now it's called uh, Ann and Nate Levine Academy in North Dallas. And then I did one year in public school again in the Dallas ISD. It was very tough. It was an inner city school. Uh, the teachers and staff were wonderful. It was a very tough audience of kids, very, very difficult environment. But, you know, they were kids. They were, they were good deep down. They were just in a very bad environment. And uh, then I kind of bailed from teaching for a while. I was a caregiver for the elderly and disabled for about 10 years. Hmm. And then I went back to teaching and as a substitute and really enjoyed that. At that point, I went down to the elementary level, which I had a lot of fun, third, fourth, and fifth grade. And I still miss them. Then my wife was injured and I uh, had to give up teaching, basically retired and became a caregiver again. She's doing fine now, but for a long time, she needed a lot of help. And, uh, but now we're, you know, we're kind of back to normal, as normal as things are at the present time. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and what I'm doing now is, and I have been for about the last, uh, let me think, about six years now, I've been narrating audio books. I, um, I've done about 40 books, a little over 40 books now for Audible of Amazon. And, uh, How did you get into that? How did you get into that field? That's kind of funny. The, uh, I belonged to a writer's group for a long time. And we would, you know, read our stuff to each other. 
And uh, the people in my group were like, well, your writing is pretty good, but uh, you know, your voice is awesome. You really need to do audio books. So I, I messed around and finally found a place at ACX, the Amazon company, Audio Book Creation Exchange, where I could upload some auditions. And I did, and I thought it would be like submitting a book manuscript, that it would be um, well, a month or two maybe before I'd hear something. Well, I had two contracts that night. Wow. <laughs> and I had eight by the end of the week, and I've been working ever since. So. And Super. I, kind of, I kind of enjoy that. It's, I'm not making a ton of money at it yet. It's coming. It's coming along better than it was. But uh, it's like anything else. You know, you work your head off for 10 years, and then you're an overnight success. So we'll see how it goes. That is super. Super, super. And, you, you know, you said that I had written a lot of books. That's true, but I've only published the one. <laughs> so, the, the and you write a lot of articles? Uh, didn't I, I read? I used to. Uh, I used to write a little bit of short fiction for different markets, and I don't do that anymore. I haven't for a long time. But uh, basically, you know, I'm kind of focused on reading other people's writing now. I'm enjoying that. I've, I've done some novels, but as you might guess, women's voices are a challenge for me. So I, I decided to start doing nonfiction, which is about all I do now, history mostly. And, and I found that those do very well. The, uh, fiction sells a lot and then it stops. Nonfiction, especially textbooks and things, which I've done some, they tend to keep selling forever. So, um, you know, I'm doing that now more than anything else, I guess. Now you mentioned, the, you mentioned the woman's voice. Were you talking about in the tone of the way you write a book? You know, I'm trying to write, when I'm trying to narrate a book. <laughs> I was well, going to say, do you narrate a fem in a female voice? I got to hear some of this. Wait a minute. You got to give us a little bit of that. I have, but it's very difficult for me. And, I, you know, I got a couple of views. says, you sound like a man trying to sound like a woman. <laughs> so I kinda, oh, wait a minute. My listeners want to hear that. I want to hear a man trying to sound like a woman. That, that's got to be good. Well, I gave you just a little example of that. And a little, I want a little more. <laughs> Easier with an, an accent. I'm pretty good at coming up with all sorts of goofy voices for males. And, uh, you know, I do one of these things down here if I need to. And just, you know, I have a lot of fun with that. But now that I do nonfiction, it's just my voice. It's a lot easier. So. Yeah. I, well, what uh, it, it, I have a number of strange voices I can use if the occasion should arise in fiction. But I don't, like I say, I don't do that much anymore. So, well, you said you do nonfiction. Do you uh, narrate any children's books? No, I have not. Uh, all of my stuff okay. is books. So, but, you know, the... Like I say, it's generally history textbooks. I'm working on one right now about the, the mound builders myth, all these mounds all over the country. There were, you know, nobody questioned it at the time. Even Thomas Jefferson said that these were made by Native Americans. There's no mystery there. But later on, this big mythology about the lost white race came up about that. And uh, there was never any such people. So, Well, I live, I live in Wise County or, you know, live around and I've been around it my, almost my life. And there are Indian mounds everywhere and we find arrowheads. And so that was kind of intriguing when you said that there's a myth that it's something else. That was the Mississippi culture. Yeah, they, there's a, a band of them from here up through upstate New York. And there are enormous ones in different places. I've never seen one, but I'm reading the book about them. So it's, it's kind of that has to be fascinating. I guess while you're, you're researching or when they send you a book, do you approve that you're going to be the narrator for it? Or do they just assign it to you? Well, it's funny. I've got kind of a nice relationship with a lady at uh, Redwood Audio now. Um, and... I've, I've done probably 15 books for them. And anymore, I don't even audition anymore. Um, I, I finish one, I write her, and I say, okay, I'm done. What else you got? She gives me a list, and I pick the ones I want to do. Okay, so you do kind of select. You get oh, you sure. get to choose the ones that you feel the most comfortable with. And the reason I ask you about children's books is you sounded like a mouse that, that in a book that I read to one of my grandbabies. So <laughs> that, would be, that would be a really... I you know, do, really interesting. I do read children's books to my grandchildren, but I don't record for them. <laughs> right. Well, Charles, we're going to take a break here and let our sponsors do their thing, and we'll be right back. I'm Rox Berkey. And I'm Charles Brakefield. We're award-winning co-authors, Brakefield and Berkey, of the Enigma book series. 
There are 10 books in the series, with book number 11 planned for release in January 2020. Each story has a central technology focus ranging from identity theft to cryptocurrency and now AI wars. These adult techno thrillers pit cyber good guys against cyber thugs across the dark net. In our world, technology is today's weapon of choice. You can enjoy ebook format, paper, or audible. We want your feedback. Until the next story, thank you. Thanks. Well, hello there, my friends. My name is Randy James, independent voiceover producer in the Dallas, Texas area, available to write and record a 30-second commercial, much like the one you're hearing right now. It's a great way to help increase awareness and exposure to your book title. It's easy to do. Simply call me, and we'll brainstorm on a few ideas, and in a few hours, I'll whip something up and send you a digital file ready to use. Remember, call or text me, Randy James, at 214-762-1942. Welcome to IndieLector.store, an online bookstore where the discriminating reader can find award-winning books. IndieLector.store is not a big corporation, so it can give up to 80% of the sales directly to the author. Help us support them by buying a great book at IndieLector.store. Join us for the 6th Annual Authors Marketing Event in Granbury, Texas on July 23rd to the 25th, 2021, where authors share ideas and learn from the professionals over a two-day weekend. Receive your book marketing certification from the only organization in the world that has been doing it for five years, Authors Marketing Guild, a membership-based organization that supports authors from around the world. Learn more at ame.authorsmarketingguild.com. Sponsored by IndieLector.Store, a bookstore that pays authors their fair share. Hello, I am the author and poet Denise Bryson. I am the author of The Things That Cross My Mind, Love's Reality, both in book and audio form. I am also noted as one of the best poets of 2011. I have two new projects coming up. One is the Blinky series, where Blinky tells us all about our coins and our bills for our children. I also have a book coming out called Say Ye. It's quotes from Denise Bryson. Just inspirational and that will help you along the way. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us, follow us, or subscribe to one of our many channels. Now, here is your host for today's show. This is your host, Charlotte Canyon, and we have the pleasure of speaking with Charles Nortman, and he's a fascinating man. He does a lot of audio books. I'd love to tell you about his latest writing, and it's called um, The Fire and the Rock, and you've got a lot of history in that, so give us a little preview of what Fire and the Rock is about. Well, I had been fascinated with the character of Moses since I was a child. I mean, the Bible says that he spoke to God as a man speaks to his friend. And I remember thinking, even as a little boy, boy, what is that like? You know? And then one day it occurred to me, wait a minute, what if Moses was just like us, that God spoke to him as God speaks to us right now in our hearts, in our intelligence, mm -hmm. you know, in our sense of right and wrong? our convictions, and through other people. So that was kind of the germ of it. I had read a book when I was very young. I was a precocious reader. You may have even you'd heard of Mary Renault, perhaps. She wrote a lot of historical mm -hmm. fiction. And she wrote, uh, she, her most famous things, I guess, is a series about Alexander the Great. But she wrote a couple of books, um, the King Must Die, followed by The Bull from the Sea, which were linked books. They were basically the autobiography of Theseus, the hero of Greek myth. And what she was trying to do in those books, she did an enormous amount of research, I'm sure, as I did for my book. But she um, was trying to show what could have actually happened in history that gave rise to the stories that later became these myths that we have today of the Minotaur and the labyrinth and all that. There are always clues, but there is a labyrinth in, in Crete today. You can go walk around in it. It was the gigantic palace that's like a maze. But, and I started, and I started thinking, you know, there's a story here in the Exodus that has not been told. 
because I learned just by sheer accident, digging around in the library at Michigan State where I graduated, that there was a gigantic volcanic eruption in the Eastern Mediterranean at exactly the traditional time of the Exodus. And that kind of started my wheels turning. I'm thinking, okay, wait a minute now. We have a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of smoke by day. We have huge ecological upsets. We have a tidal wave where the, where the water falls away and then comes back in an enormous wave. And the topper, this is very much like the explosion which most people have heard of, of the island of Krakatoa in the Java Strait happened in 1883 the biggest natural explosion in the history of the world that we knew of, people could hear it 600 miles away. Wow. It gave rise to a tidal wave that went around the world four times. And there is, of course, mass death in the area from the strange gases and so on. But the topper for me was when I read that there were three days of darkness in that area of the world after this explosion. It was so dark that you could hold up a match in front of your face and you couldn't see it all the smoke and ash and soot that was in the air. And I thought, I've read that before in the book of Exodus, the darkness, and it was just, everything just fit too well. So I started doing a lot more research and learning about this time and doing research in the um, in Jewish tradition as well, bringing in a lot of things that most people don't know about that are not in the Bible. They're in what we call the Midrash, the literature surrounding the Bible and the, and the books in it. And uh, it took me eight years to get the thing written and edited and finished, but I'm pretty proud of it. And I think it's a good book. It, it must be a good book. <laughs> Here it is. Best books of the year from Kirkus Reviews in 2016. I'm kind of proud of that. Yeah, yeah very good. You should be. Thank you. And uh, you anyway, uh, it's, But the funny thing is, with all the research and everything I did, it's not about that. It's about the story. The story of these people, like Moses is not Charlton Heston, the great hero. He's not a cartoon character. He's, he's a real man. And his love for Zipporah, his wife, this woman of the desert, is a very deep one. And that is his guiding light. And uh, it, it's a pretty good story, if I do say so. And I kind of try to bring these characters to life. And a lot of my reviews said that. You, know, you feel like you get to know these people. And it was... It was a challenge. A lot of it took me some time to, to get it right, but I think I finally did. I'm very proud of it. Now, did you take Moses back to when he was younger, or you know, where did you pick up in the Fire and the Rock? Well, it, this book is narrated by his wife, Zipporah, is okay. speaking. and we go. We begin with her youth, and not really her childhood. Well, a little bit of her childhood, and uh, she was the oldest of seven girls. Her father had no sons. And uh, then we go up to the time when she meets Moses, whose name, by the way, was not Moses in Jewish tradition. And we recognize the name Moses in the Bible to honor his mother. Moses is an Egyptian name. And uh, his given name was probably Yakusiel, which means hope. He had a lot of other names that were obviously given to him later in the tradition, lawgiver and prophet and so on, and Moses, the Egyptian, you know, raised, raised by the uh, princess of Egypt, the Pharaoh's, you know, younger mm -hmm. sister. Mm -hmm. But um, it, they meet, and we don't ever really learn directly where Moses was or what had happened to him in his early youth. Or at the time he left Egypt, there are some mm -hmm. differences in my book in the biblical account. The reason he left Egypt in my book is he found out he was a slave, which he had never known. And suddenly he's faced with this, you know, this identity crisis. He could go back to the palace and live in luxury while his people were, you know, slogging away in the brick pits and dying. And he didn't want to do that either. Mm -hmm. So he ran away. And he wandered for many years. And we get a, a glimpse of that. He's, he knows many languages and knows a lot of things. He was a, apparently a physician in Greece for a while. And he was a soldier in the Far East and did a lot of things in his past. And these things keep coming up as he needs these skills and this knowledge. And you're a very wise man, but a very humble man. And um, then he meets Zephora and he finally has the home. 
And then all that changes when he goes up on the mountain. And mm -hmm. geez, I'm not going to give away that because I've, I've done some interesting things. <laughs> well, tell I know what I have to do. I have to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to free my people. By the way, I never used the term Pharaoh. That was not accurate at that time. I just referred to him as the king of Egypt. So like I said, I did a lot of research here. And it, it does, it's not obtrusive, but it's important to the book, I think. Okay, well, tell us, you said that his wife is the one that narrates the book. Uh, what was your thought pattern, and why did you want that to be from the feminine viewpoint? Or, you know, what, what triggered you to use her as the, you know, the narrative for well, the book? The feminine viewpoint, that was important to me. And that was, of course, a challenge for me. I'm not a particularly feminine guy. But uh, um, to me, it was it, Moses himself could not tell the story because the central mystery has always been and still is for me. And I wanted to leave that alone. What exactly was the relationship between God and Moses? I don't think we could ever know. And in my book, Moses himself isn't sure. And, and Zipporah has to deal with that as well. He has a power about him, but, but he is not aware of it. He's always doubtful. But when he speaks, especially to the, the Hebrew people, she feels that power, and so do they. And Moses afterward is like, did I do all right? You know, He doesn't have that enormous self-confidence that we saw in, you know, in the meaning of the movies or anything. He's just a man. And he goes into this role of caregiver, of lawgiver and prophet pretty reluctantly, but he feels like he has to do that for his people and for his understanding of God and for what is right and wrong. And he confronts Pharaoh to his face more than once. More than once. Well, Charles, we're going to have to take another break here. Our sponsors have to do their thing. We'll be right back. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Thank you for watching or listening to Indie Beacon Radio. Our sponsor, IndieLector.Store, is the only bookstore that pays authors their fair share for book sales. Help authors to succeed and enjoy a great book by supporting them at IndieLector.Store. Enjoy a 10% discount with coupon code SHOPPER20 at IndieLector.Store. Coupon valid until December 31st, 2020. That's IndieLector.Store, coupon code SHOPPER20. What started as a love letter to her son has become an international love letter for all parents to their children. Now you can read acclaimed author Shanna Lee Charbonneau's story to your children. When her son was very sick, she calmed him by singing her own song to him. She turned that song into the book, My Mama Loves Me, I'm Her Little Boy. She wrote three more magical books for all parents and kids six and under. Available at Indie Lector, Amazon, and all local and national outlets. Here, Texas is proud to present the Lone Star Festival on May 29, 2021 from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., where Texas authors, artists, and creatives come together for a Texas-sized event at the Seguin Coliseum, Seguin, Texas, sponsored by Indie Lecter, Authors Marketing Guild, and the City of Seguin, a perfect event for those who enjoy the creative arts. Register for your free tickets and prizes at lonestar.bookfestival.network. Authors Marketing Guild is a membership-owned organization designed to help authors succeed and learn how to better market and sell themselves and their books. Join us at AuthorsMarketingGuild.com and receive so many benefits you'll wonder why you didn't join sooner. That's AuthorsMarketingGuild.com. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us, follow us, or subscribe to one of our many channels. Now, here is your host for today's show. This is your host, Charlotte Canyon, and we're speaking with Charles Norman. Now, Charles, there's a couple of things. We've only got a few minutes here um, that we need to do. One is, you know, I need you to let the people know how they can get your book and where they can get your book. And if they want to listen to any of your audio books, you might want to mention a few of those. But we definitely want to know where we can get The Fire and the Rock. Well, the Fire in the Rock is only available on Amazon. And you go to the Amazon website and just do the search, The Fire in the Rock, Norman will get you there. And um, 
Uh, if you put in my full name, Charles Henderson Norman, that will link you up to all that and all the books that I have narrated as well. Because I use my full name as my professional name when I'm narrating the audio books. And there's, like I say, about, I think, 40, 41 of them. And, um, but The Fire and the Rock, I'm kind of proud of that. It is available, <clears throat> excuse me, it is available on, uh, in paperback. Uh, it is available on Kindle. And it is also available in audio book form. I narrated the book myself, which was kind of a peculiar decision since the, the narrator ought to be a woman. But mm -hmm. I knew the story better than anyone. And mo mo many of the reviews say it bothered me a little at first, but you know, he, he had put so much feeling into the book, I didn't notice it after a while. And I think it's pretty successful as an audio book too. But you know, the paperback is the main thing. and. Um, it's, it's, it's not a short book, around 150,000 words, but um, I don't find any fat on it, as they say. And um, you know, I told a story that needed to be told. It's, it's a framed book. It begins <clears throat> with Zipporah as an, a blind, aged widow living at the foot of Mount, well, I changed the name of the books uh, of some of the places slightly and the names of some of the tribes, for instance, the Hebrews are called the Avru, children of Abraham. And uh, she's living at the foot of the mountain that Moses had gone up when he passed. And this young man comes by to, to find out if it's true what he's heard, that she still lives. And then he convinces her to tell the story. So she's telling the story and he's writing it down. And okay. Yeah, that's the frame of the book. So, so it kind of has a flashback. Oh, yes. The entire book is a flashback. Yeah. The entire book is a, is a flashback. Now, Charles, do you have any, uh, are you going to write another book? Have you have anything, any other writings that you want to do or that you, you know, had an inkling for? Uh, there are any number of books that I would love to write. I've got one in rough draft back here, but I doubt I'll ever do anything with it. Uh, it's very different. It's a romantic love story and adventure with, between a couple of bottlenose dolphins. But uh, yeah. a little, little science fiction element in that as well. But I doubt if I'll ever do anything with that. No, I think I'm done. I, I put everything I had into this book. You, you just you <laughs> emptied your soul into it. Well, Charles, uh, before we go, uh, in a sentence or two, can you like tell our listeners if they, you know, have a story inside of them or, you know, if they want to be an author, uh, you know, what would you advice would you give them? Sure. Every, every great writer has ever said this. I believe Stephen King was the latest, but many others have said the same thing. What you do is you write. You write, you write every day. You don't worry about editing at first, you just write. The story comes out of you and the more you write, you get better at it and you look back and see what you need to throw away. But you just keep writing. You keep telling your story and let it come out of you. Then you get the hard part to me, it took me three years to write the first draft, it took me five years to edit the thing and get it in the shape that I wanted. But that's what you do, you just have to write there's a lot of jokes in the writing business about that. Well, I was going to write today, but you know, let me just scroll down a little further. Oh, I got one more email. No, 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 no. You sit down and you write. Doesn't matter keyboard, pen, and paper. You just write and you keep writing. Well, Charles, we want to thank you for all all you the advice you've given us, telling us about the fire and the rock. And this is Charlotte Canyon, your host. And I want to remind you that a rose is like a book. You can't know its beauty until you look at it. And a book is like a rose. You won't know its full beauty until it's open. Bye for now and stay safe. See you later. Thank you for listening to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. To learn more about Indie Beacon services, to be a guest on the show, or to advertise on our show, please visit our website. Indie Beacon Radio with host is Charlotte Cannon. Indie Beacon Radio is produced by B. Allen Bourgeois Fathers, Mark and Guild, LLC, copyright 2020. Voiceover by Randy James, Lydia Bello, and B. Allen Bourgeois. To be a sponsor of the show or for more information, please email us at info at authorsmarketingguild.com. To be interviewed for the show, please complete the form at radio.authorsmarketingguild.com. 
Use the car is rejoiced by Ram Cord.